Savior standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. John Millar, would you open us in prayer, please? blessing upon the day, upon the preaching of your word. As we meet here, God, I pray that our hearts and minds would be on thee, and uh, God, we just get something to preach in, something that we need, and, and uh, just respond in a way that's pleasing to you, and uh, we do pray you be with our pastor and his wife as they're, as he's over preaching uh, over in Jehalis, and just uh, bless them and their trip, the meeting over there, and uh, we just once again thank you for being here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 268. 268. Mine to 
tell me whence I came, mine to teach me what I am, mine to shine me when I rove, mine to show a Savior's love, mine thou art to Suffering in this wilderness Mine to show by living faith Man can triumph over death Mine to tell of joys to come Let's be seated. All right, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Got a number of people out today. Uh, I know, obviously, our pastor is over preaching in Chehalis, Washington, um, with Brother Pastor Mike Cherry. Uh, so be in prayer for him. And then also, I think, Brother Chad Peterson's uh, speaking at his church's anniversary. And then uh, Brother Clark is also preaching uh, somewhere. So. Uh, be in prayer for those uh, that are out uh, speaking and preaching. And then also, I think we got some sick people today, so I think it's the last I knew that your bowls are still sick, so maybe pray for them. Uh, as far as announcements, uh, upcoming events, we have a baby shower for Emma. That will be Friday, November 22nd. I believe that's at 6 p.m., uh, just right over uh, on the uh, Sunday School Hall. Also, we have Thanksgiving, obviously, coming up, um, and that is at the church. Uh, we're going to meet here for those who don't have family to attend or if you have family you want to avoid you come here to church and uh, <laughs> we'll have a good time I think we're going to do that all over in the Sunday school hall as well and uh, 1 p.m. sharp is where we'll start and we'll have some some games I think there's uh, some Bible trivia that Emma put together so she sent out a thing to uh, study up on so if you think you know it all you don't need to study but if you want to you can get get prepped and maybe help your team out on scoring points so <laughs> uh, we would have fun time there also, uh, there's a white elephant for the ladies. That's December 13th, so uh, just kind of a, I think a gift exchange and a Christmas party or something like that, a dinner party. Uh, also, we're doing Christmas caroling, and that'll be December 21st uh, at 4 p.m. We'll meet at the church. I think we're going to go to the, the mall, as we've done in the past, and uh, uh, maybe somewhere else, but at least we'll start there and uh, sing some carols and pass out some tracks and that. And then this is still a ways out, but... Uh, for those of you that need a lot of preparation time for a sermon, we're doing 15-minute sermons on New Year's Eve. So uh, if you want to get together for that, if you're an able-bodied male, we'll probably be preaching. So, uh, so uh, get a sermon together for that. Um, that'll be New Year's Eve uh, at 6 p.m. So, all right, other than that, we'll sing another song. Okay, let's stand up one more time with the blue hymn book and number 40, 40.
Brother Kirschman, he's preaching for us this morning. So if you could welcome him, we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I guess anytime I come back here, I always think about, naturally, I think about Brother Isaac. And uh, I got saved back in 2008, and I think he uh, moved to Billings around in 09, if I got that right. And um, you know, and that's and it wasn't too long after that he was uh, going to Charity Baptist, and my parents were going to Charity Baptist then, and um, and I, they actually stayed with my parents for some time when they first moved to Billings, and that's how we kind of got acquainted, and, um, and so we go back a few years, and he's just he's been a good friend over the years, and and one of the things I, I love about Brother Isaac is he's just real, yep. and very sincere, and. I just I enjoy and appreciate the fact that I could pick up the phone and call him about anything, and he's going to listen. And he's going to be give you very honest opinion, and there's times he's just been like, you know, I, he's just not going to say anything. He's just going to listen. And I, anyway, I say I would say I appreciate him. I appreciate this church. I appreciate what God has done here over the years. Uh, if you want to take your Bible, we're going to be in Exodus chapter number one. How many of you ever done a white elephant gift exchange thing before? This can get pretty funny. And uh, I got to thinking of one. I remember uh, back at uh, we were part of the church, Faith Baptist Church in Helen, and we had a white elephant gift exchange. And I, I picked up this kid. His name is Stewie, and uh, he was—he's a special needs guy. And and uh, so I think it was maybe my brother-in-law. He he got a Justin Bieber CD. And took that, and uh, Stewie, he he picked that that present, and he was, I mean, he had the Bieber fever. It was, uh, it was pretty funny. He was pretty excited about uh, Justin Bieber. Anyway, it's funny where your mind goes to with you hear different things. But uh, this morning, I guess this morning, this afternoon, the goal is to be in the Book of Exodus, and. Really just to kind of give some thoughts, um, maybe even some things that in, in your life to springboard off and to, to look into. And um, I don't know how it is for you, but I'll get to reading sometimes. And sometimes you just, you'll go, you'll go, and, and all of a sudden you'll get on something. And it's like you wake up in the morning and the Lord just puts you on repeat. And like, okay, go, go back and, and reread that. And that's kind of how Exodus has been for me as of late. Like I've get a couple chapters in and it's like the Lord just brings me back something else will come up and I'll get to thinking about things and and I'll go back and just just revisit it and uh, so I've been I guess just kind of meditating in the book of Exodus for for a little while now and with that being said let's start reading in verse number one now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt every man in his household came with Jacob 
Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was already, uh, was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And with that, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, that the Spirit of God would just minister to us and guide us and, and make the Word become alive to us. And so, Lord, you know the needs of every heart here, Lord, of what they stand in need of, Father. And I pray that you would meet the need of the heart. And again, Lord, just thankful for the opportunity to open your word and, and have a foundation, have something that we can lean upon and something that we can glean from and, and get some sustenance for our soul. And, and so, Lord, I just pray, God, you please help us here this morning. And I pray that you would be with Pastor Isaac and, um, Lord, the meeting that he's at. And I do thank you for him. Thank you for his friendship. And, Lord, I pray that you would please bless them there even now as well. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here in Exodus, right, it starts out with these names. And these names, if, if we were to go back and trace them out in Genesis, are, are names of, of people that were to receive the promise, right? They, you have the promise that was given to Abraham, and, and he's promised this, this seed. He's promised this nation that's to come from him. And, and so we find in the book of Exodus that, right, as, as at large, Exodus is a book about the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt and the giving of the law and all those things. And so these these names became a nation, right? It was, uh, this is the foundation, and, and we can look at many nations. We can look at, at our nation, right? It, it's, it has a foundation where, you know, 56 men came together to sign the Declaration of Independence, and, and, and that's what we have, right? We have that, this foundation, but that's, that's not just, it's not just a bunch of names. It's, it was a nation that was birthed. It was a growth, and, and here we are today. I think, uh, what is it, this next year we're going to celebrate 250 years as a nation, right? Do I got that right? Since 17, or in two years? 1776? Yeah. So um, that, that's amazing, right? And uh, terrifying at the same time because oftentimes when you read about in history, nations don't last too long, do they? But this nation has lasted quite some time. And, and God had reestablished them over there in Israel. And, and, and I mean, the, the very name in and of itself of, of, you know, starting with that name, the, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Jacob turn, becomes Israel. And, and again, so we, we see here that this, this nation uh, is, is, is born, right? And this, this, these names became many people. And... Um, and, but this generation that is mentioned here, right, with, with Jacob and his sons and Joseph and all that generation, they died. And, and they pass off the scene much like, you know, the, the generations before us. This morning with my parents, we were visiting about my, uh, my grandma and kind of the heritage on, on that side and, and, and the generations that just get forgotten about. They died and, and, and life goes on. And... You know, and I think in a lot of cultures that's, that we, we lose out on that. And that story is kind of important as it gets passed along the line of, of you know, where, where people come from. At least I, I get intrigued in, in some of that stuff of knowing where, where my family came from. And, and oftentimes it's just I can think back to my great-grandparents, but I don't know anything past that. But our, our family history goes much deeper than that. And our nation's history, right, we can look back to maybe just the, the presidents that, that you have had the opportunity to, to vote on and, and, and whatnot. But often past that, I, I don't know how you are, but, you know, I, I have not looked into too many presidents prior to the ones that I've been alive for. And, they, and, and, and just the, the, we forget things. 
And, and not only do we forget things, but we see in verse number eight, right? It says, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now, praise the Lord, we got the Bible, and so we can see in the book of Genesis, Joseph's pretty significant in Egypt. But it's amazing to me that once this generation, right? And I, and I read that in verse number six, is, and, and Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. So you've got Joseph, you've got his brothers, and then that whole generation that I would say of even in Egypt is dead. And there arose a generation that knew not Joseph. And, and how quickly we can forget, you know, our, our heritage, if we will, or, or how quickly we can forget the the good that someone has done. And you think about Joseph, right? I mean, he came in as, as that prison, that little slave boy, and he turned into a steward, and then he gets locked up in prison. He goes from the prison to the palace, and, 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 um, and God divinely uses him, right? He even tells his brother that, you know, I mean, don't, don't beat yourself up. I mean, God sent me here for, to, for you beforehand to, to save you because he knew what was coming down the pipeline. And, and, but just like that, we can forget. And I, you have to forgive me. I, I forget things. And there's things that people have done for me. And, and, and as life goes on, you, you, kinda, you can forget about it if you're not careful. And this, this forgetting led into a, a life of bondage for the Israelites. And I mean, and again, you know, I, I don't get political and all that kind of stuff. I, I honestly, the, most of my life, I've cared less. I, I think as I get older and my kids are getting to that age where they're going to go on in life, I've, I've become more interested in in what's going on in our nation. And and you know, you care about your your kids and what things are going to look like for them in the future, right? Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> On a bigger picture, you know, I know Joseph is not God. He's a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how often in our Christian life can we forget what Jesus Christ has really done for us? You know, we, we oftentimes will, will make the comment about, you know, it's, it's, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And, you know, I'd say most of my, you know, my upbringing was the, the focus was more about a religion, just you go to church, you go through the motions, but I, it reached a point in my life where I realized, hey, there's, there's something to this Jesus. And, and when I saw myself as a sinner and saw myself as someone in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ became pretty important to me. But if we're not careful, right, we get saved, we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, and all of a sudden, we can be guilty just like any other religion where maybe there was some en enlightenment that came along the way, right? But all of a sudden, it just turns into religion, you know? And so we, we can look back and I, I you know, I, I, like, uh, I like the Methodist movement back in the day of uh, intrigued by the circuit riding preachers and, and, and that kind of a thing. And there was uh, Brother Van was a Methodist that was in Montana and traveled around Montana and and, uh, you know, I mean, and they, they preach the gospel. And, and, but if you look at large at the Methodist church, for example, you know, you'd say how far removed they, have, they are from, from John Wesley and from that foundation that they have, from someone that receives such, such light and such uh, uh, enrichment from the scripture and receives salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it just became, it's become vain religion. Okay, and so it's, it's easy to pick on all that, but how about as Baptists that we're not, we're not guilty of doing the same thing? Amen. And we can come together and we can be a group of born-again people and over time we can just get to where it's just like we're, we're punching the clock. We, we end up doing the exact things that we say that, you know, all these other religions are doing. Yeah. And so we gotta, we got to be careful of that, that we don't forget what the Lord Jesus Christ has done and going back a little bit to, you know, family. And so I oftentimes, I, I think back and, and my great grandparents on my dad's side, on uh, the Kirschman side, um, from, from what I understand is he got born again and my grandma got born again and, and they went from, you know, playing in the honky tonk to playing in the church and playing music that is. And I mean, he was very outspoken for the Lord Jesus Christ and, and whatnot. And as, as the generations kind of trickled down, there was, there was just a steady moving away from, from that life, from, from serving the Lord Jesus Christ and the importance of it. 
And hold your place to look over at Judges chapter number 2. And so throughout the book of Exodus, we see the great victory that, that God works in the Israelites' life and delivering them from Egypt. And then we see them come in, you know, spending the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And then we see them come into the land of Canaan and they take the land and, and they're getting established. And um, notice in chapter number 2 and verse number 8, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun, another great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And so we see the death of Joseph, this leader that brings them in. And we don't get too far uh, farther into the book. And notice in verse number... Um, 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done in Israel. And again, we, we see the passing off of a generation and they forgot. And if we're not careful, right, we'll, we'll just, we will forget what those generations before us, the groundwork that they laid. And, and there's no doubt, I mean, we could go around the room and there have been uh, believers in your life and in your family that probably have laid great groundwork and a great foundation. And if we're not careful, we'll forget the work of God that he did in our father's lives. And even in, you know, you consider the Baptists and, and the, the movement and the work of God that has taken place in this nation throughout the years. If we're not careful, we will forget about the working of God and it just becomes the ways of man. Okay, we forget. So, and that's, I mean, I think that's any parent, any pastor's fear, right? Is that there's a generation that raises, that raises up after you that knows not the Lord. Go ahead and go back to the book of Exodus. And so we, we see in this, right, is this... Uh, Verse 8, Now there arose up a king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And verse 9, it says, And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. And all of a sudden, this new pharaoh, this new king says, we got a problem. Right? The Israelites, they're, they're multiplying. I mean, they're, they're more than we are. And we, we see their fear in verse number 10. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they... Join also unto our enemies and fight against us and, and so get them up out of the land. And so we see their fear, right, is that, hey, if, if all of a sudden we got some enemies coming in that they're going to raise up and they're going to fight against us, right? We, we've got this infiltration from these Israelites and they're multiplying faster than we can multiply. And if, if we're not careful, we're going to get overtaken by them. And that's always, the, the, I guess, the fear of any nation, right? I mean, we can think about our nation, and we've been infiltrated, if you will, and, and the fear is that sometime, at some point in time they're going to take it over. I remember years ago hearing uh, about some Muslim that got into politics, and she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use the, the Americans' freedom against them. Now, that's scary, right? And so there, there's no doubt you can get... Uh, well, where all of a sudden you, you feel like you're being infiltrated. And, and so all of a sudden in this thing, they're, they're going to tighten things down. They're going to make a, a plan, right? He says, let us deal wisely with them. And, and we see what they do, verse number 11. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. As if the burden wasn't enough, let's, let's put uh, a taskmaster over the top of you. Now I'm in management, so I understand sometimes what it means to feel like a taskmaster. Get to work. Um, yeah, anyway, I could tell, start going into postal uh, stories, but I'll, I'll spare you. You probably have enough of your own. <laughs> Where's my package? But w what I see in this is, is and, and this is in any culture, in any denomination, in any belief, is that there's, there comes a point where 
the enemy and and for us in a spiritual sense right pharaoh is a great picture of the the devil and what is he doing as, as satan he's he's trying to wear out the saints and and we live in a day and age where where maybe it's not directly wearing you out because of your beliefs but is wearing you out in a social setting where just i mean it it, it gets overwhelming in this life Oftentimes, I'll run into men and I'll say, hey, how, how's things going? And, and, and I say this all the time, too. My, my first response is, busy. Wore out. I've got too many irons in the fire. Right? And it's easy to just get, and then on top of that, just have the, the affliction of, of the enemy that is, is just putting things on you and poking you and prodding you and, and just trying to make your life miserable, right? If, if I remember right, it, it is said that he, he's, he's trying to wear out the saints. And, and so in this, we, we can see that, that, I guess what I see in here, is what, what are they trying to do is they're trying to break their spirit. And if, if you can break a man's spirit, right, you can basically manipulate him. You can control him. You can do whatever you want. And so I see in this that Pharaoh is trying to, he's just, well, one, he's trying to destroy the family. And, and we, right, the, the thing that God is trying to establish, the, the, the Satan is trying to destroy. So God has, has established the family, and so therefore you can expect that Satan will try to destroy it. God has established the church, and therefore you can expect that, that Satan will try to destroy it. And Bible Baptist Church is no exception to that. And, and I imagine, I mean, there's probably been some people that have come through here, and they're no longer here anymore, and there's probably a reason why they're not here anymore. Right? And, and unfortunately, that, that kind of stuff, it, it hurts, but it happens. And, and if we're not careful, we, and we see this in verse number 14, right? And made their lives what? Bitter. And ultimately, if, if, if the devil can get you bitter, bitter with the saints, bitter with the servants, bitter with uh, just every aspect of your life, then guess what? He pretty well has got you and not just you because when that root of bitterness springs up, right? The Bible says it defiles many. And so it, it affects a lot of people. And so that, 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 that root of bitterness that, that the devil is trying to instill in you, I, it's dangerous. Yeah. And so, we, again, we just just trying to bring the, the, about this point of what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to destroy the family and they're, they're trying to destroy the male. And, and that, that's taking place in our culture. They're trying to destroy manhood. And so we, we see in verse number 16, right? And when, you know, when uh, the more that they, they afflicted them, let's back up to verse number 12. It says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. You know, and that, that's the same thing with uh, the church throughout the ages, right? As the Roman Catholic Church just poured out the, the uh affliction and the persecution upon Christians, the more it grew. It's, and it's the same today over in Muslim countries where there is, and we don't hear about it as much, but there, there is the underground church there that they're facing great persecution. I've heard recently that there's, uh, in many of those um, Middle Eastern countries, Iran and, and whatnot, that there, there's a guy over there that has started many churches moving around and in that, there is, see, there, there's a, I don't want to say too much because, anyway. But he was asked, he goes, how many, how many Christians have you lost to persecution? And year to, like year to date, he had lost 250 members to martyrdom. but they were growing. And so the more and, and the more that they try to tighten down and try to afflict, right, then, then we, you would see growth. And you saw that all throughout, you see that all throughout church history. And, and then the dangerous part, right, is where it goes from persecution to, okay, well, let's, let's just merge the two together. Then we become complacent. That might be where we're at. There's not a lot of persecution, per se, on you know, the, the church in America that, that I can see, but there, there is an underlying attack that is taking place that's not out in the 
forthright where it's, people aren't being, you know, put in a bag with rattlesnakes and thrown in the Yellowstone. But guess what? That If you read Fox's Book of Martyr, that's the stuff that was taking place to those believers. And I'm reminded just again that, you know, one thing that man uh, learns from history, that one thing that you learn about history is that man doesn't learn from history or whatever that saying is. But we, we see here in verse number 16, and he, so when their plan didn't work, right, of just, just making them serve with, with hard bondage, you say, well, we're going we're gonna to add to it then. And so if, if, we can't, if we can't get them to be so miserable that they quit uh, multiplying, then I guess we're just going to have to do something else. Verse number 16, and he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools... It's interesting, I got to look into those stools and apparently that there are, there are two stones that are put together like a potter's wheel uh, type of a stone. And so it's like once they were birthed out, right, they're right on the potter's wheel to, be, to being shaped and whatnot. And I think it's a great thing to consider when a child is born, right? I mean, right away they're on the potter's wheel of, of their life being shaped. Oftentimes we think, oh, when they get older, we'll start, we'll start instilling in them faith and those kind of things. No, you start right when they come out. And so we see, again, verse number 16 at the end, it says, And if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then ye shall live. And so what we find is we find a feministic culture, right? Kill the man. Kill the warrior. Um, and I forget the name of the book, um, but there's a, there's a book out there uh, that into the wild or something like that. It, it has to do with uh, just th that manhood and that warrior spirit that's within a man. And, and our, our culture has done a great job at trying to destroy that or to mask that or to, to downplay that. And, and man, it's a, it's a good thing when, when you boys are thinking about, you know, you're playing G.I. Joe and you're storming the castle and you're saving the princess. Well, that, that's, that's a warrior spirit inside of you. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, as a little boy, man, I remember that kind of stuff. I, I was going to be the hero, man. And that should be in you. And so we, we see this and, and, and our, you know, they, so they had a policy, they had a procedure of, okay, this is what we're going to put in place, that when that man-child is born, we're, gonna, we're just going to kill away. We're going to do away with the male. And I know maybe we're not doing that exactly in our, our culture of just absolutely killing the child, though, I mean, you could look at abortion, all those kind of things, but at the same token, you can look at it and just what we're doing in our culture. And, and I look at this, right? We got these Hebrew midwives, and there's people go back and forth on were they Hebrew, actual Hebrews, or were they Egyptians? I kind of believe they were e Egyptians, and Pharaoh calls them in and says, this is what I want you two to do. And we see that in verse number 15, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was uh, Sifra and the name of the other Pua. That, uh, Sifra's name means fair. The other one's name is splendid. And so he's given them instructions, right? This is what we're going to do. And so we see that with the midwives. And, and again, I'm just trying to give you some food for thought here and, and, and what's going on. Because I think for so long, at least in my generation, is just like you, you looked at uh, the medical field and all those kind of things. And, and, and we see midwives, right, connected with medical field. And, and all that's taking place within that realm is, is really, it's, it's destroying our manna down, down to the food that we eat, right? That it is, it is affecting hormonal levels that I think is, is, is a cause of, of some of this stuff, okay? Some people are saying conspiracy theory. Some of this stuff is so mainstream now. Like 20 years ago, you'd have said conspiracy theory. But now it is so mainstream in front of us that it's just like, wow, this is like, there's, this is real. Yep. You know, uh, for example, I was, was visiting about this yesterday is, you know, the whole thing with using soy and everything, right? And, and it has such high levels of estrogen in it. And so they're, they're feeding all this stuff and, and our boys are eating this stuff. And so guess what? That's affecting their testosterone levels and, and adding so much hormone into them. And, uh, 
And I, th I think this all has a, has a part in it, but it's just like, but then it goes even deeper, right? Because it's just like soy in of itself is not bad, but it's then you look at how it's treated as it's being grown and being sprayed, and that's what multiplies these estrogen levels. Yep. Okay? And you go research this stuff out. I, I've just, I've heard different things, and, and, you know, honestly, this is kind of a weird message for me. This is, I don't typically talk about this kind of stuff, but... I just feel like it, I don't know, it, it keeps coming up and, and it's, uh, it's right there and I see the destruction of our men, of our boys. And, and all this stuff that plays a part and we like to think that, you know, well, it's just, it's not out in the open, right? We're not, we're not castrating them. <laughs> now we are. <laughs> uh, take, yeah. And, and all this stuff, how it's interlinked with, with pharma and how they're all backing these food industries. And it's just like, well, why, why is it that, that this is healthy? You're reading the ingredients. You can't read the ingredients. But, but our, our medical field say, no, this is good food for you. Right? And so all these things that, that come into play and, uh, I mean, our, our political agendas of all this stuff that's going on with transforming. And um, how, how many know Andy Hearn? missionary over in Nepal. So his son, William Hearn, uh, went to school. Maybe some of you have seen this, but he actually did a video uh, as part of his, his class and his schooling is uh, on, and it's called Transformed. And he actually does an interview with a guy that, that uh, went through the transformation and then detransformed and, and all that stuff. And it, that's, it's very interesting, but it's just like that's, that's the culture that we live in. And then that's being fed. And I mean, and, and this thing gets, you can look at so many different things of how psychology and counselors and, and that medical field is being used to target and to destroy not just our, our manhood, but our families. Okay. But I, I recently, a guy in my church, he uh, sent me a, an article and I know polls, you can't really, I don't know, yeah, but there's this one poll where, and, and I, I like to think it to be true, but there is, there is, there's been a, an increase of young men that are, that are seeking out and going to churches and, and wanting to like, and like sticking and wanting to grow in churches. And so there, there's a, there's a increase of young men in churches that they're saying like, hey, there's, something's got to be different. There's more to life than this. And, 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 and there's, there's, there's that desire that's being resurrected in them. And I, I hope it to be true. I hope the, these polls that, that, and this uh, survey that was done is, is true. Because that's what we need. Amen. Okay, now I, I say all that and I guess, so men, you're, you're under attack. Our families are under attack. Our nation's under, under attack. Our church is under attack. And it's not just in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense. Okay, and so we, we can talk about all that and say, yeah, we, we recognize that. But in a spiritual sense, it's even probably more so. And it's, it's all, and I think, probably related and linked together. And so we, we are looking forward to, and, and in this foundation in the book of Exodus, we, we see this problem. Right, we we see this struggle. We see this 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 thing that is taking place, and and all throughout the the Bible, right? When you, even when you see the prophets show up, they're not showing up when that when all is well. They're showing up in time of crisis. They're showing up in time when when there is a departure from the truth. They're they're showing up when when Israel is going into apostasy, and and so there there's a and, and so in here we see that there's a deliverer that is coming, right? Or or as we we know about Christ, a prophet like unto Moses, and so we see that Moses really he is that this coming of this deliverer, this this prophet is coming, but we see that there's so much against him. And there's so much against the, the prophet that will stand up and proclaim the truth of God's word. There's so much against him. Right? And oftentimes we can look at, look at things and say, well, there's, you know, you know, judge them by their fruit. And what most Christians take that to mean is, well, how many, how many are they running? What, what does numbers have to do with it? 
what's their fruit, right? What, what's, what's going on there? And so, I mean, you can look at the prophets. You can look at our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're basing it upon numbers, he had pretty poor numbers. We find oftentimes that the, the multitudes were, were departing because of what he was saying. He ended with 11. Right? And from there, just Christianity has, has, has spread and the gospel message has spread. But leading up to this Moses, this deliverer, and I mean, and praise the Lord, you think about nations and whatnot, and we just had an election and whatnot. There, there was no Savior on the ballot, right? <laughs> we, are look, we are looking for our deliverer to come. We are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. right? And so, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I, I want to, I enjoy this nation. I enjoy living where I live. I enjoy the, the blessings and all that stuff, but, but I'm looking for the real deliverer. I, I'm looking for the upper taker, right? I, I'm, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm not looking for the antichrist. Remember, uh, I used to work for Lurkine's Coca-Cola in, in Helena, and, and I delivered those five-gallon jugs of water, and, and uh, a couple of guys that we all worked together, we went to church together, and... and uh, this one guy was getting frustrated because uh, another guy kept talking about the Antichrist. And finally he just goes, listen, man, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes you can get on that end time stuff where all you're looking for is it's just it's dark. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's depressing. Listen, man, we've got to be looking a little farther than that. Amen. Okay, we've got to be looking... To out into eternity. We've got to be looking for the one that saved us. And, and we need to be not quick to forget him. Now, now so in this and leading up to this, uh, Moses, right? We, I, I want to focus in on, on this for a little bit. And we see some heroes, I guess, if you will, are uh, in this passage that, that God uses. And I think oftentimes, I, for me, I, I read over this and, and overlooked it and overlooked it and overlooked it. And for whatever reason, this time, like it just, it, it's been highlighted uh, in my reading. And, and I praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for the fact that you can read through the Bible and you can read through the same chapter that you have read through time and time again. And all of a sudden, God just shows you something else. And the next time you might read through it and you forget all about that and God shows you something different. That is the blessing of having the living word. Amen. So we, we find here that in this destruction of the home, this destruction of this, this nation of Israel and the destruction of the, these children of God, that, that there's some heroes in this story. Now, first off, look at chapter number two. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And here they're, they're not named, right? And you know what? You might look at, at yourself and, and your spouse or your future spouse or and one of you think, I'm just a nobody. It's all right to be a bunch of nobodies. Unnamed, unknown, right? And you, you think about the, the people that have, have influenced history when oftentimes their upbringings and, and their, their parents are they're of no name, those that were of, of influence, you know, is it uh, Spurgeon? Like, we don't even know the name of the person that, that preached when he got saved, right? If I got that person right. And some of those, I mean, you can go back and they'll tra trace it back to, well, so-and-so was led to the Lord by so-and-so and so-and-so, and then it gets to a point where just like, we don't know who it was. But it was someone that was used of God. And so, first off, look, look back there in chapter 1 again, in verse number 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Sifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And you know, you know who Pharaoh employed to do this? A couple women. I know how we're going to do away with those men. I'm going to employ these two women to murder these boys when they come out. Right? And, the, and the, you know what, ladies? We often read about manhood being under attack. Guess what? Womanhood is under attack. 
And we might see the destruction of a man, but guess what? There's the destruction of the woman as well. And I think sometimes that, that can be overlooked. But it needs not to be overlooked because you know who the heroes are in this story leading up to the coming of Moses? It's a bunch of women. You know, you know who might be the heroes in, in the story and in, in the survival of, of this nation or of, of this church or of those kind of things? Guess what? It might be you women. And so to think that, oh man, this is, you know, I, I was thinking of that song, this is a man's world. I forget who sings it, but... James Brown. You want to sing it for us, brother? <laughs> right? Right? But, but in there it says, this is a man's world, but what would it be without a woman or a girl? And, and so it all works together, and, it, and it's, it's about, in manhood, man finding his place, and it's also about the woman finding her place. And those coexisting together and working together for the greater picture and not this, you know, who, the a hierarchy of who's better, who's not, but it's, it's coming together in unity and working together. Woman in her womanhood and man in his manhood. And, and so we, we see the attack of the devil very much this way that, you know, he, he is trying to employ women. Guess what? You, you women got more power than you think you got at times. You got more pull than what you think you got. And it's an, it's an important thing for, for a woman to learn how to use in her, in her womanhood. Influence. There's not a man in this room that's not influenced by a woman, either for good or for bad. I'll let you come preach it, brother. <laughs> but notice in verse number 17, but the midwives, what? They feared God. Oh, man, you want to be a hero? Fear God. Don't, don't fear, oh, man, well, this is, this is what our culture is saying. I need to, what a woman needs to be. There's a, maybe some of you have seen this, Matt Walsh has this documentary out called What is a Woman? It's hysterical. And all these people that want to define what a woman is don't have the first clue what a woman is. Can't even define it, but they can go over to the middle of Africa and in the middle of some tribe and they just look at this Matt Walsh like, are you an idiot? Why are you asking these strange questions? Because that's the culture that we live in. And so instead of embracing your culture and, and what it has to define you as, fear God. And what's important to God? And, and so because these guys feared God, and I, I love this word, verse number 17. What's that first word? But, right? They were employed to do something, but... And I, I like, uh, you go through the Bible and you find out where all, you know, talk about something but God. Right there in Ephesians chapter number two where it talks about, you know, about what I, what I was without Christ. And then it gets there, I think in verse number four it says, but God, who is rich in mercy. Praise the Lord. So we, we see these first set of women, I, I guess we could look at them as, as the heroes in this story. Because guess what? They could have been destroying they could have been killing, but when they, they, those babies had come out, guess what? They, they feared God. They feared God and they valued life. Right? And, and we live in a culture where, where women want to say, well, they, you know, they don't value life. My body, my rights. Right? So we, we see these midwives and, and you know, go, looking back at at that, I, I believe there is a great uprising within our medical field of people that are fearing God. Praise the Lord. If you've got a doctor that fears God, praise God. Hallelujah. And if you're a doctor, fear God. If you're a nurse, fear God. Okay, so we, we, see, we see these two here. Um, they don't buy into this agenda that is, that is destroying the family. You know what they're going to say? They're going to say, I fear God and I think I'm going to just 
I'm going to go on valuing life. I'm going to go on fearing the Lord and, and His ways and, and the value that He puts on a life, the value that He puts on the family, the value that He puts on the church. Right? Instead of, hey, instead of me just going in there and with this feministic spirit that, that can go around and it's destructive. And I know that's not popular and Isaac, forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but if we're not careful, men will embrace the manhood that is being preached from across this land and, and destroy it, and the women will embrace what is being preached about womanhood across this land. And being preached, I mean, as far as from your news channels and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's destruction. You need to embrace who God made you to be. And that doesn't ma matter man, boy, woman, child. I mean, embrace who God has created you to be. And when we all embrace who it is that God created us to be, man, and we work together, right? You think about the church and God put every single one of us in the body as it pleased Him. As it pleased Him. I, I don't know about you, but in the, in the body of Christ... The Lord didn't say, Brent, where would you like to be placed? He put me where it pleased Him. Now, I might not always enjoy and like who, who or what I'm connected to, but guess what? I'm going to have to learn to embrace it, aren't I? Okay, so we see, and I need, to, I need to pick up pace here. We see secondly here in chapter number 2, in verse number 2, it says, And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. We find over there in the book of Hebrews, right, by faith they held on to him. And we see, we see not only these women that feared God, but we see a woman that had faith in God. She had so much faith in God that she trusted God with her child, puts him in this, this ark of bulrushes and and, and, and covers it with pitch and puts it out in the river's brink there and says, God, I'm going to trust you with it. And ultimately, is, is that not what, what we do as parents? As we're, I mean, yes, we're trying to raise them and nurture them and we're trying to give them the right foundation. But ultimately, you know what we're going to have to do? At some point in time, we're going to have to say, all right, God, I trust you with this child. You know, we need, we, we need women that, that have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and can just trust God. That's a lot, of, a lot of times you hear people talk about, you know, cutting the apron spring, uh, strings. There comes a point in the mother, right? You don't want to let go of, of your little boy, but you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to trust God. We, we see in this, this story as well, in verse number 6, as that the child is found, and when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. You say, are you going to say that Pharaoh's daughter was a hero in the story? It looks like she's a hero in the story. Because you know what she could have done? She could have just said, you, a Hebrew. Pushed him under. But you know what? She had compassion. She, she allowed that God-given natural affection that a woman has for a child, and, and she allowed that to affect her heart. Right? And, and if we're not careful, we live in a culture where that natural affection is lost. That, that's talked about in the book of Romans, right? Without natural affection. Now listen, we, we can talk about that in, in other aspects too, but how about just the natural affection, the God-given affection that God has given a woman for a child? It's amazing. And, and you need to allow for that natural affection, that, that, that natural womanhood that God has given you. And then lastly in this passage, we see in verse number 7, it says, Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And at last we see a good sister. We see a sister that, that speaks up not for the destruction of her brother, but for the saving of her brother, for the nurturing of her brother. You know, and, and you can look at that, and I mean, with, with uh, Miriam there, and I mean, she, some things about her is, man, she, she not only cared for that child, she cared about her mom. Oh, I, I know someone that can nurse him for you. 
She didn't say, do you want me to go get the child's mom? I'll go get a maid. I'll, get, I'll go find someone for you. You know, not only that, but there's, I've, I've thought about this too with Miriam as, you know, obviously as Moses was being hid for three months, I'm pretty sure Miriam probably understood that Moses was a boy. I'm pretty sure Miriam probably understood that Moses was to die. Right? And, and, and she was, I think she was probably as much involved with the secrecy of this child for three months as anyone else. I mean, and she was committed. She was in this thing. Praise the Lord for some sisters that, you know what they are? They're committed to Christ. They're committed to the, to the cause of Christ. They're, they're um, you know, they, they, they care. They have compassion. Not only that, I think she, she had great curiosity, right? As she, the Bible says here that she stood afar off. In verse number four, and, and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. I see some curiosity there. And then lastly, we see her here as she sees the emotion of Pharaoh's daughter. You know what she does? She calls out. Says, hey, I got a solution. You know, and it seems to me like may maybe this is just my mind. I, I tend to overthink things, but in my mind's eye, I can just see her being like, I better... I I better strike while the iron's hot before she changes her mind and, and loses that compassion and starts thinking about, well, what's, what's, you know, what's my dad going to say about bringing home a Hebrew boy or whatnot? And so she just, she, she strikes on that emotion. You know what amazes me sometimes? How, how women, that they just, they know how to say the right thing at the right time. You know what's interesting to me over there with Nehemiah? When Nehemiah went in before the king and the Bible just throws this in there and the queen being with him. Pretty interesting. And now all the Nehemiah just says, well, how can I be happy with what's going on with my people? And I just, I just wonder. I just wonder, did, you know, I can just hear that queen being like, honey, we should just really let him go. We should help in this matter. Praise the Lord. I don't know, some of you maybe know Brother Brad Whitbrock. He's a uh, pastor to church out in Oregon. And then now he's pastor down in, in Houston, Texas there. But... Um, they have a, a little girl that they adopted. And strangely enough, it was some relation to Brother Brad and, and that she had gone out, gave birth to this child along the river in Oregon, cut the umbilical cord and left the baby to die. Well, some fishermen came along and, and found this baby, took the baby in. And uh, Brother Brad's wife's name is Connie. And so she sees this thing on the news. And, and the way he says it is like she just, all of a sudden she's just like, I'm, I'm going. God wants me to go. And so she drives down to the hospital and a few days later, like all the hoops they had to jump through and whatnot, but she brings this little baby home and they adopt her and her name's America. And, and I mean, she's just a spitfire of a little girl. But, you know, all of a sudden there was, there was that compassion in, in Connie's heart that said, you know, I'm going to do something about this. We've got to do something about this. Listen, that natural thing inside of you, don't lose that. Don't lose that. And, and in that, right, we, we fast forward to now we have the life of Moses. You don't know of, of, of when, when man embraces his manhood and woman embraces her womanhood, you don't know the impacts of that. And so we see these two midwife servants that, you know what they do? Fear God. We see these parents, you know what they do? They have faith in God. We see this, this, uh, this Pharaoh's daughter and she has compassion that God has given her. We, we see Moses' sister, you know what she has? She calls out and we, we see all these things playing in a part and all of a sudden we've got the birth of Moses. We've got the, and then hopefully later on today we'll talk a little bit more about Moses. But just some food for thought for you. Just some things that, that I implore you to, to take to the Lord and say, Lord, am I embracing my role? Am I, am I helping or am I hindering? Am, am I being a, a blessing or am I being a burden? Like, how, where am I fitting in in this thing? As, as Bible Baptist Church goes on, am I, am I being a help or am I being a hindrance? As my family goes on, am I being a help or am I being a hindrance? And you, you kids are not like, oh, well, I don't fit in this. No, we got Moses' sister. 
She fits right in there. You fit right in there. You all have a part in this thing. Embrace your part. Father in heaven, I want to just thank you for your goodness. And Lord, I pray that these thoughts would be a help to your people. And Father, I ask that you would please take your word and Lord, maybe whatever was ministered to each heart here, Lord, that they would take that and allow you to define what that means for them. And Lord, that they would seek you on that thing. And Lord, that we, if nothing else, just be mindful and aware that there is a spiritual attack on our families. Lord, what, which that attack on our families, it, it affects every aspect of life. Our churches, our communities, our country. And so, Lord, may, it might even seem at times, Lord, that we, we just feel like what it is that we are doing is, is amounting to nothing. But, Lord, it's all these little things that are being done in this life of Moses that amounts to a great thing. So, Lord, help us to not neglect what it is that you have, what it is, Lord, that you are calling out in us. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother John, you go. So, what are you going to do about it? That's. <laughs> um, every message that you hear, what are you going to do about it? But just so the message is you're one person in a big world. The Bible says the world lieth in wickedness, right? Are we going to change it? No. <laughs> We're not going to change it. What can you do, though? You can control how you respond, right? Right? So, like the uh, midwives and like Miriam and like Moses' mother and Pharaoh's daughter and all these people. The world lies in wickedness, but you can control what you do. Amen. Just do right. Amen. Just do what's right. Um, carried on into Joseph. You remember Joseph was in Egypt. He was by himself in a pagan superpower. He just did right. Yeah. Remember Elijah? We've been going through kings lately. you got Elijah and you got the 7,000 that hadn't bowed their knees to Baal in the middle of a pagan nation. Right. They just did right. Yeah. That's all you got to do. Um, and easier said than done. <laughs> um, but what the Lord expects of you is just to do right and love Him. That's what He expects of you, simply put. 252. Let's go to the Blue Hymn Book and number 252. Save you, he will save. 
save you. He will save you now. Father, thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for uh, your words and just the examples of people that do right um, in the midst of the times that they live in. Father, thank you for those uh, examples there. Help us to do that ourselves here today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.